Hello and welcome again to the Scaling Up Business Podcast. I'm your host and scaling coach, Bill Gallagher. So on the show with me today, Steve Conine. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. Yeah, so Steve is a former client. Um, he's the owner and CEO of Talent Framework. Uh, they're in the business of workforce planning, temp staffing, search, retention, you know, things like that. Uh, in the world of people. And people's been a regular topic. This particular show will probably focus more on the success that Steve had in applying some of the aspects of the Scaling Up framework to his business. And I thought it was really great that he was willing to come on and talk about what they did. So uh, Steve is the owner and CEO of the company. He's a regular contributor to the Northern Nevada Business Weekly. He's been a co-host on a local TV program, Starting Over, Starting Up. He's a former chapter president of the entrepreneurs organization EO in Reno. He was also uh, the U.S. West Communication Director and the Regional Director for the Western Region for the Entrepreneurs, the EO organization. Uh, Steve and I met some time ago. Uh, we're talking today about the work that we did that put his company on the ink list and uh, the growth. So we're going to talk about uh, how they did some of the work that uh, that would take you to 174% growth in three years. So that's kind of the core of the story. Along the way, you'll hear some of Steve's other experiences, but really excited to share a client case study with a real client who's willing to share with you all. So uh, Steve and I first met at one of the regional, well, I don't know if that was the first time he met, but we met, but I was leading a session on leadership skills for in, within the world of scaling up for one of our regional conferences. Steve was there um, and he contacted me and said, you know, I think you might have the right vibe and scaling up might be our thing. <laughs> so I'm really excited to hear about it because there's some unique things about uh, your story. So before we get into that, would you tell us a little of your background to, before you bought the business and all that? Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, well, I really started out, um, you know, kind of as a uh, climbing the ladder, the big corporate ladder type guy. I worked for Walmart originally um, right out of college and was in their management program and uh, transitioned on and, you know, to some other companies. I, I worked for Amazon.com for a while when they were just first a startup. Uh, wishing that I still had my stock options from those days now, but um, carved a different path. I ended up going to work for a third party, a national third party logistics company. That I was in that industry for about 10 years in distribution. Um, and during that time, we were a, a heavy consumer of temporary staffing services. So I had had, had an opportunity to work with a, a local staffing company quite a bit, got to know the ownership um, fairly well. In fact, we used them so much that we had had internal discussions about, you know, should we buy or start our own staffing company uh, and save a few points on, on the margin and, you know, we'll run it as an, as an internal business uh, and then seek some outside clients as well as servicing ourselves. The idea never really went anywhere with our management team, you know, beyond that kind of discussion. Um, but I was the one that was kind of negotiating that with the previous owners. So, you know, Years and years went by, and the phone rings one day, and they said, hey, are you guys still interested in buying our business? We're ready to retire. Um, and I happened to just get, you know, notification of the closure of the company, buyout and closure of the company that I was working for, and I said, you know what, I don't think so. You know, I've, I've moved on jobs twice since we had first talked, and um, I don't think that's really going to be a possibility. I'm going through this closure of a facility right now, and had tons of other things going on and you know, a week or two goes by and they called back again and said, well, what if we, you know, helped you finance it? Would that be interesting? And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I don't know. Thanks, but you know, really kind of busy. And, you know, another week or two goes by and they called again and said, well, what if we stayed on and helped you for six months and, you know, got your feet underneath you. And like, they just kept doing everything possible to make the deal happen. So um, after some negotiations, it was my leap into entrepreneurship. So I left the corporate world and um, purchased this mom and pop staffing shop in Reno, Nevada. That was you know, relatively small at that time. I think they were doing about 1.8 million in annual sales. So um, they stayed on, agreed to stay on for six months. That lasted for about six years um, and various forms of contracts with the previous owner. And um, and I was able to you know buy this franchise business at that time and and keep it running for, oh, about 12 years. Um, and then my franchise 
Azor at that time, one of the world's largest uh, staffing agencies, uh, employment companies in the world, um, had made some acquisitions in, in my particular neighborhood. And I had a contractual uh, stipulation in there that said that they couldn't, you know, invade in, in my territory in any way, shape, or form. So it created a window of opportunity for me to pursue some legal action and actually exit the franchise system, which was a trial in and of itself. So there are lots of things that a franchisor can do for you in order to help kind of keep your business going. You know, they have a lot of resources. They had a ton of money and legal and risk and, you know, all sorts of human resources, professionals uh, in the hundreds that as a local small owner, you don't usually have access to those kinds of resources. So it was another leap of faith to leave that protective safety net and go 100% out on my own in 2013. And that's when the talent framework name came into play and, and I really became a, you know, a sole survivor, so to speak, in, in the entrepreneurial world and, and started the talent framework from scratch again, basically. Had to change the name and change my systems and operations and everything else. So um, it was just like starting all over again. And that's about the time that we started working together or shortly after well, that? Shortly thereafter, you know, a, few, a couple of years after that, you know, yeah. I had uh, figured out how to kind of put things together and, and keep things running and um, started to learn from a business owner's aspect, some of the insurance aspects and risk and contracts and things like that that had been done for me the prior 12 years. Uh, my focus kind of shifted towards some really heavy, more heavily operations function things. Uh, that I was spared being a franchisee. So I've had a couple of learning curves to go through for, you know, having already sort of been in the business for, for 12 years. Uh, I had to learn a lot of things over again. And certainly things of like learning how to grow as an independent um, and building a framework outside of a franchise organization where they do all your advertising for you and send you national clients and, you know, you're kind of spoiled in some respects. So um, that's where scaling up you know, provided some framework for me to kind of start to define some of those systems that, that I didn't have in place for myself on my own. So I, um, when uh, I first spoke to you, um, there are a couple of things that I can remember that I liked, uh, I think are useful for others to hear. So one, you were definitely on the smaller side in terms of total employee count and revenues and that kind of thing from a lot of the companies. You also didn't have a huge goal that you want to achieve. It was a more modest goal, but you like laid out all the stuff. We had an easy conversational style. You're really open. And some people are really cagey with me in the beginning. And I'm like, wow, this is a lot of hard work to do this communication. Like, I don't want to be selling so much. I'd rather start coaching um, than selling. And so that was easy. And you were pretty open, like, you know, let's try things and do things. And, um, and even though you've done some similar work and had experience with it, you were, you were willing to um, collaborate, like have somebody be your coach, which uh, I think made it really a good fit. And I looked at your stuff and I thought, we definitely can do that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, it's been super helpful for, you know, I'm a build a better mousetrap kind of a guy. And so if I can collaborate with somebody in order to make that happen, I think it helps me in the process and help my company in the process. If I show that I'm willing, then my staff was also a little more willing to kind of follow along. I think if I have sat there being cagey or resistant in some way, they'd have gone, eh, so we're really not doing this. We're just right. going to Yeah. It. What is the message that you're sending there? Right. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. So we came in and we started in with some basic stuff, right? We started all the kind of core things. We laid out and built out most of the elements of the one-page plan. In particular, we did the purpose and the values, and we created a BHAG, and we created a kind of a three-year picture of the things that you wanted to accomplish um, so that we would have that. And then we started doing all of the execution habits, the quarterly meetings, the annual planning, the weekly, the daily huddles, things like that, dashboards, metrics, job score, like there's a, you know, we began to implement that stuff in uh, with your team and we began to impact the culture uh, there, right? The first, what was that like in, in that early period? What did you notice? You know, I think really early on, it's always exciting, right? You're learning something new. Um, and, and I think we went through a couple of different tool, dashboard tools over the last couple of years. So, right, you're trying to learn another another piece of technology to, to keep track of things. So um, it's good and it's bad. And I 
I think within management teams, right, there are people who really, who really jive on that sort of tools and metrics. And then there are those who are like, they just hate it. They fight it tooth and nail. And we certainly experienced that where some people really bought into it and others really struggled with it. Okay, so, wait, hold that, hold that thought. Let's go there because that's important. But before we get off the dashboards and the metrics piece, I remember one session in particular, we came in and we we're having the conversation. We we're like, okay, we have this whiteboard here in the meeting room and like most of this shit doesn't matter. Like we don't like, and so we just started erasing everything, right? And we got down to just a couple things. It was like filled with numbers, this big whiteboard. And we erased most of it. Then we said, okay, what is now needed in there? Is there anything else needed? And we did a couple of tweaks, but mostly we ended up with fewer numbers overall. Yeah, I think we got down to about three or four key metrics was it. And we were tracking probably upwards of 10 or 12 before that, which were meaningless to most, of the, to most everybody except me. Right. Uh, they matter to you. <laughs> right. They matter to me. Yeah. 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 But, but in not terms totally. of like driving any kind of performance or setting goals for people at a production line level, you know, a lot of that higher level stuff was lost on them. And you could see them fade away in the meetings. Like they were just like, this doesn't mean anything to me. So, yes. Yeah, so I think with some teams, and if you're pursuing, say, a complete sort of open book management, you can educate people and give them even more numbers. But even still, you've got to focus down to a few numbers that are actually driving things that are part of your daily huddles, your weekly meetings, not all the metrics, not the fullest understanding, but the key ones that really uh, focus attention and action in the right places, right? Yeah, and, I, and they have to be in a place where, I mean, it's one thing to put them up on a board and then they're there, but they had to be numbers that they see in their world on a daily basis. Like, you know, so for us, it's when payroll gets run, it's either how many, how many time cards were there, which is an indication of how many people do I have working out in the field or how many hours did we actually log, you know, week over week. Um, so they're easy numbers to follow and track, but it's, it has a tangibility to it where people can kind of feel, Hey, a hundred people is a lot of people, but 300 people is a whole lot of people, right? It feels, bigger and more substantial. Absolutely. Okay, so there was tweaking of things like that. I remember quite a few iterations on daily huddles, on weekly things, and I think that's important for people to recognize that these regular routines, habits, and things like that, they start to create your culture. The particular flavor you bring to them, I see behind you, you've got uh, uh, your uh, a version of your manifesto on the back. So it's got purpose, it's got a BHAG on that, it's got some core values in there, and that that creates a reference that you can do. But you went through quite a few iterations of some of that stuff before you found a piece that like worked for you yes um and again same thing it's a struggle with some people they really buy into it and i mean we had to be we always had to be a little silly about it in the beginning like we would recite that you know like the pledge of allegiance it was every daily meeting we would come in and you know somebody would have to recite the core values and um did it seem a little silly at first yes did it actually Actually, legitimately take hold in people's minds. I think it really did, um, because after we started talking about operational things, I would hear people reflecting those values back. And like one of our key ones is that relationships matter most, um, and that's both with the people that we employ and the clients that we send people to. And so people would tell a story about, oh, I was talking to you know X Y Z client, um, and I told them, you know, the relationship really matters to us. That's why I'm calling you. You know. So it removed some of the fear of being salesy and turned it into just more of a relationship rather than a client vendor um, sort of a status. And those sorts of things, over the course of time, we were able to let go of the silliness of it um, because it had imprinted on everybody that, hey, relationships is something that's really important to us. So when you're interacting with people or you're making decisions, are you doing it in a sense that protects the relationship or furthers the relationship with people? Are are we solving problems for people or are we just selling you know, watches and pens out of a trench coat? So it really kind of helped put a frame of reference around things for why we were doing what we were doing. And it helped people believe in it a little more rather than just being some sort of a telemarketer saying, you need some temporary staff today. Um, it was, hey, what sort of problems are you guys experiencing? Is there anything that we can help you with? And this is what we're seeing in the market. It helps my staff become experts in my little micro community in terms of what was going on in the labor market. Yeah. 
So one of the other things I think it's useful that I see there and is part of that was the purpose conversation. I remember really well, and I think of this when I talk to other clients now, especially in the early stages, is a lot of times people are like, oh, I don't know about this purpose. And you said roughly that. You said, I don't know about purpose stuff. We're not a cause-driven company. We're provide a business service. It's staffing. And I'm like, I think it'll be helpful. You might be surprised. Just give me a few minutes with your team. Let's see what we can come up with. And so we ask the typical questions that we ask and engage a little bit. And then I, I like to send people out in pairs for a walking exercise for this. And I sent people out in pairs. I said, all right, you know, go out and walk and listen and entertain these questions, make some notes and come back. And we threw the stuff up on the wall and we started to move post-its around and find the commonality of the ideas. And we came up with that phrase in a matter of less than an hour, we keep the world working. And you guys were like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's it, right? And I, that was so validating for me as a coach to see that here's somebody who's skeptical, who's not sure that that's useful or that they can get to that. And you did it so beautifully and naturally. And then I've seen since then in visits uh, to your office where people have it on the back of their t-shirts walking around the office, right? Yeah. 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 It's funny to say, you know, and I truly believe that we're not purpose driven, but, you know, encapsulating it in, in just a few words or a simple phrase, it actually became our purpose, right? And it was easy to believe in. It was, it was, it was sort of hidden to us. It wasn't that we didn't have it. Um, we just need a little help kind of uncovering it. And so that's been super powerful. Yeah, it's clarity and it's creation, right? When you actually create it together and declare it, you bring it into and that focuses it and then you start to align more with it. Uh, because, so that's awesome. All right, so let's shift into the people. So one of the side stories here is, we, so we had three years and 174% growth to do with this, um, but with v almost net same people. So there was a great deal of uh, increase to be had from productivity and focus and alignment, um, but not everybody was down for that kind of company in that, um, so talk to us a little bit about the people who w didn't want to play and uh, and some of the mistakes or challenges in the world of people. Yeah, well, I think it's, so there's an industry frame of reference that as a franchisee I always had that as you were growing, for every 40 people that I would have working in the field, I should have two people in as internal staff to kind of manage that little miniature book of business if you want to think of it that way. So that was always kind of my, my thumbnail sketch of like how many staff I should have. You said for 40 in the field, two? So one per 20? One per 20, yeah. yeah. Or it's a team of two, basically. You always wanted to build them in, in teams. Was there, yeah, yeah. There's some strategy. Pairs. Um, so when I was growing, I was adding people yeah. internally for, for some period of time. And those people weren't, you know, utilized to their maximum capacity. And the more people that we added, the more time we spent kind of trying to get people up to speed. And, you know, they had a small manageable book of business. But I think as humans, they had a ton more capacity than we were actually tapping into. So when some of the recessionary times started to happen, you know, business scaled way back and I scaled way back on people. As things recovered, I didn't really follow the same model anymore. I just asked more uh, and, and kept adding more work to the existing staff that I had. So I kind of found that, that the people that I had hired had so much more capacity to produce than I was really giving them credit for. And so we, we really kind of utilized that. And I suppose the flip side of that is that you run the risk of maybe burning people out at some point. But, you know, I try to keep pretty close tabs on monitoring that on how people are doing and how their workload is working. Everybody's an individual and that's a little different. But I, well, I that's a key point. You've got to balance the the productivity gains against the engagement of the people, the human side. So human yes. and people and productivity are a counterbalancing thing. You can drive people too hard, and then you have to do something to make them feel great or to create breakthroughs in the way they're working so they're not carrying such a load. Right. Or you lose them. And that happens to me, too. <laughs> they move I, on. They, they, you just simply grind them into a nub or they, they implode and, and yeah. go away because they need some relief from that sort of pressure and workload. And I've had it happen, had it happen both ways. And I think it's good to have experienced that because I'm a little more keen to some of those warning signs now where I need to pay more attention to them or I need to say, maybe we should look at shifting the role a little bit. Maybe that's too heavy for you to carry. So let's teach someone else how to do that. And you can pick up this new thing. And then they re-engage, right? The learning process kicks back in again. And, 
uh, it's something new and they feel a little relief at the same time. And, and I'm able to not only cross train and have a more well-developed staff, but I sort of relieve a little bit of the pressure. Or I should shift it to a different place, I guess, in, in that case. But, you know, I've been a model study for myself at this point of saying people are really capable of actually doing quite a bit if you present it to them and organize it in such a way that they feel like they can handle it and absorb it. And once they kind of get their arms around it and they can get it into a routine or a system, then it becomes much more manageable for them. And then they, you know, they're ready to accept new challenges or additional responsibilities as time goes on. So, um, well, we use been able to stay staff net neutral. Uh, just to name the tools, uh, Precisely, we use the Gallup Strengths tools uh, to identify talent themes and then try to align those to the job roles um, or to the approach to the particular job requirements. And then you, uh, we also use a love, loathe, or a love and hate exercise where we look at what things you love and what you hate, and then we try to figure out how to either change up something, give something away, automate something on the hate side so that um, you can be effective in your role, right? And we did plenty of that. Uh, but you had some people who just didn't want to play no matter what and um, and needed to go. <laughs> yeah. And of course you hang on to them for too long. Yeah. Right? I, I think inherently in my DNA, I'm a rescuer of sorts. Um, coupled with being a problem solver it means I think that I can fix anybody. Uh, and their issues, and the older, the more experience that I get, the more quickly now I realize neither of those things are probably as true as I'd like to believe, and I should make decisions to move on from people that don't want to play in the, in the game that I'm playing more quickly, for, for certain. I spent the better part of a year with a business development person who didn't make a single sale, but, you know, I like the guy. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, because of that personal relationship, um, yeah. I just kept hoping and thinking that we could fix it and, you know, that he felt the same way that I felt. And it was just clearly not. Yeah. Uh, he was a, he was a good actor in yeah. that regard. And, and I just kept, kept it going on far too long for my own, my own good. When I look at our clients that make really the most rapid gains and the ones who struggle to make as fast gain, and I, I definitely have clients who grew faster than you did. Um, and one of the things that I notice commonly is they make really rapid changes to their staff. When somebody isn't playing the game or getting the religion and getting on board and driving things and they can't make a couple of adjustments within a, a very few months, they just move them out and say, listen, you need to go be an A player somewhere else because you're not going to be it here. Yeah. And uh, it's there's compassion involved so they don't generate lawsuits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there's certainly a smart way to do it. Right, office attacks and that kind of thing. But they send them on their way, and and they try to stay friendly in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think there's a, there's a right way to do that. It's a personal struggle for me because I feel like I've committed to their success and their livelihood, and I want to make sure that I've owned my end of that responsibility. And uh, that times blinds me from seeing where they're just simply not wanting to reciprocate that kind of commitment. Yeah. Really, you know, when I first get that gut feeling of that, I should be able to validate that and, and move on sooner. So I'm working on that piece still. Well, I um, it's funny because as a coach, I feel like it's not my job. It's my job to be pulling for everyone to win. And there are times when I think I should move on from a client that I am also slow at and times where I'm really pulling for a key executive to move on. Uh, or to um, to develop, and I really ought to be telling you or somebody else, look, they're not, I don't see that they're going to make it, you know. Uh, I mean, that's not truly my role as a coach, but there is an aspect of advisory that's needed there to say, listen, I don't I don't see it here. Like, it's, it's time to do it. I probably hold on too long there, too, trying to help people. And I think in part because when you see somebody have a breakthrough, and move through to a new level of performance and discover a personal boundary or whatever, it's intensely gratifying. It's just not necessarily the business of scaling, right? Right, right. And then you believe, well, certainly if they were capable of that, they're capable of even more. So, you yeah. know, let's turn up the heat and, and yeah. go to the next step. And yeah. everybody has their limits. 
So over time, your team got better and better at becoming aligned, more aligned and on focus. We did job scorecards. We did quarterly priorities. We, you created games and things like that. T tell a little bit of the ups and downs of that piece. Um, yeah, it was similar to sort of, you know, it's the next phase of what are you doing with your core values and, and your purpose and everything else. How do we, how do we incorporate stuff deeper into the culture and, and make it fun? And, um, you know, it comes with its bumps too. We tried again, a little bit of silliness, you know, and game playing and, um, a, a variety of different things to just engage people and have them, you know, want to participate in it more. Um, and we've tried hardcore you know, numbers and uh, incentive bonuses and, hey, if you get this, you get that type of a thing. And I, I think we ended up somewhere with kind of a healthy mix. I think the game playing and whatnot, though, that sort of dissipated. The idea was set in that we want to have fun with this. Yeah. Not necessarily just to play games and be silly as the sake of it, but it's okay to have fun at work and we can have fun with the work that we do. And so I think it, it gave people permission to kind of relax a little bit and be a little more vulnerable and honest and, and be able to poke fun at themselves and a little bit, of, you know, at each other uh, is healthy to a certain extent. Absolutely. But, you know, we, the pendulum did swing back towards where it was a little more serious. And, you know, when we looked at, hey, here's where our goals are at. Where are you? How, you know, how come you're not getting there? Is, you know, what can we do to help kind of foster you? you know, continuing to, to strive for this or hey, I see like you've kind of lost interest in this altogether, you know, what's going on? Um, so it, it's, it's helped kind of set some boundaries and then we've been able to refine them a little bit as, as time went on, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think when I first got into it, it was, okay, so pick a program. These are the rules, follow the rules, do that. And that rigidity it is sort of what started to kind of alienate people. They're like, okay, really not into all this silly stuff. I'd, I'd rather just kind of be a little more business focused. And, the, you know, the silly people are like, hey, this is a little too business focused. Like, why can't we have any fun with this? And so I, I think, like all things, moderation and variation um, helped us kind of establish that where we could kind of bring the whole group along together rather than people kind of retreating back to their silos, right? We all like to do what we like to do in our own way. Um, and in my particular environment, everybody has a private office, so they have a tendency to sort of retreat and mm -hmm. just do the things that they like to do the way that they like to do them and it's protected. Yeah. So this coming together and the strategic planning and the kind of forcing everyone into a room, into a funnel to say, these are the three or four main things that we want to work on. We can make them as fun as you want to make them, or we can take some of them seriously or, you know, a little bit of whatever really kind of helps get the team involved in picking what they wanted to do and, and even comfortable, but a little challenged at the same time. Yeah. So there are two big factors that have helped your growth as well. And you've worked with some big accounts. You have hundreds of accounts. How many do you have? Um, I, well, over the course of a year, yeah, we'll approach a hundred accounts or so. You know, some yeah. things are, you know, a, a few hours worth of assignment and other right. things are, you know, I've had clients for 18 years. So yeah been a mix but so a mix and i think that's really healthy but there are a couple of things uh your work with the state of nevada and then the work in the ecosphere of tesla who came yeah. and built something called a gigafactory in your backyard that right. you both figured out how to jump on and and you saw the opportunity and then we kept the focus on it with the quarterly themes right i remember hot love we don't have to hot explain love. where that yeah. came from and what that represented but um uh, but that was a, a thing that really helped that focus on that and making a game of it, right? Focus and playfulness. Well, I think when you're small and you kind of tend to think that way, right? And I'm a local operation and I'm a sole owner and yeah. small team, like we cater to the small guy. And when we have the opportunity to bid for, you know, a big government contract for the entire state of Nevada, we really felt like we were elephant hunting at that time. Um, yeah. And it was exciting. And to have a couple of those come to fruition where it sort of proves we do have the capability and we do have the capacity and, and we can compete on that level. And now we've been successful with it, you know, for several years, super gratifying and, and rewarding. And, you know, financially, it has increased, you know, revenue and profits and it enables us to do a lot of different things. But it's been eye opening in terms of well, what? other sort of clients or businesses should we be looking at that we previously would have thought that's just out of my league 
right? right. And, and I don't look at it that way at all now. I'm, I think keeping an eye open for, you know, a little bit of big client hunting is super healthy because, I, you know, I do feel like you're certainly able to compete with any of the big players out there uh, just as well as anybody else can now. And I don't think we believed that five years ago. That's really great. And you guys are not even consistently doing and using everything in the scaling up framework. You know, we've picked and chosen the pieces and done them in the way that works for you and your company. Yeah. And I kind of, I think I rethink that all the time. I go, ah, what if we had just done the whole thing and done it right? Um, but you know, there's a saying in, in my household, I'm an amateur remodeler and, and we say it's not a Conan job unless we do it twice. So <laughs> Maybe we're ready for our next iteration of going back and doing scaling up right for a change. Well, some, so some clients will use a, a great deal of acquisition, will invest in marketing efforts, um, will hire on salespeople. You didn't do any of those things. It was more about being efficient, right? And I mean, I encourage you to do some of that, but it's not kind of your nature. You're a, more of a refiner and improver of things. Yeah, yeah. And right. I mean, it's... I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, we've achieved our growth over two of the last three years without any sales efforts at all. So there is something to, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, but we honed internal operations so that as growth came in, the internal staff could process that. I think if I'd have had, you know, a really heavy marketing and sales effort, it probably could have swamped my boat, so to speak. I would have had more than I could have handled and dealt with at that time. So... Well, you did pursue, we did it the right way, right? You bid and courted the state. Some people would call that a sales effort. You bid and courted subcontractors in the Tesla world. You, some people would call that a sales effort, but just not like somebody blanketing everybody and working the territory, right? Yeah. We didn't just start knocking on doors and, you know, telemarketing everybody and, and, you know, I got what you need. We've been very conservative and very targeted about who we wanted to go after and why. So. Yeah. That's important for us. So uh, before we go on a little bit, I just want to let folks know that although I only start, I don't know, two to four new clients a year, it's a really small number and I can only work with about 10 at a time comfortably. Um, we do have a lot of coaches in our group and I'm happy to recommend someone. If somebody is listening and thinking that maybe they're a candidate for the coaching work, I want to just invite you to go to scalingcoach.com slash coaching. I'll say it again, scalingcoach.com slash coaching. There's kind of an overview there and an, uh, like an application, like, hey, I'd like to be coached. Here's why I think I'd be a good client. And then um, if, if I think that I can help you, I'll have a conversation with you one way or the other. Um, if I think you should talk to one of the other coaches who's in your area or specialize in your industry or whatever, then I'll connect you with that. So if you think and you'd like to begin the conversation uh, to do some of the kind of work that Steve does, uh, go to scalingcoach.com slash coaching and fill that out. Of course, all of these episodes, over 175 now, uh, are there. We do one new one a week. We have free tool downloads. I'll even give you a copy of the Scaling Up book for free if you pay the shipping and handling. So all of that stuff is there at scalingcoach.com. Um, back to your thing a little bit. Here are the things that I think that I'm hearing. So one, we've got over a three-year period, 174% uh, growth um, and without a lot of sales, without any focus, sales and marketing effort. Um, it comes from building a culture and getting alignment and focus. Um, and, uh, and that shift is really where the ability to grow with almost the same or, or maybe the same, we haven't looked at the exact number, but maybe the same number of people, no yeah, appreciable. Two. Yeah, we're the same, yeah. same state. Same state. Now some change, some people come, some people go, right. But the same, uh, total number. So it's a really interesting story. Um, and I think illustrative of a lot of our work and it's where, uh, people are kind of surprised when I talk to them. I'm like, look, it takes time and money to work with me or any of our coaches on growing the business, but I, I will guarantee that you'll be happy with the results. I will you know, and offer a, a, a really an open-ended guarantee, whatever discount you want, uh, if it's not producing results. And, uh, and it, but it is an investment of, of time and money to do the work, uh, not just with me, but to translate that into real results in your business. So. It's not a going through the motions kind of a thing, right? You really have to 
have to engage that. But it, it has these enormous payoffs. So if you want to talk to Steve more about it, his business, or you have a staffing need in the area, or uh, you'd like to sell your business to him, or you'd like to buy him out, or like, you know, whatever, you'd like to have a, a business conversation with Steve Conine, uh, you can find him at talentframework.com. So I'll put that in the show notes as well so that you can connect with Steve in there. Uh, as well. So I think it's really great story of, of solid growth, applying the habits, building the right kind of culture on the right components, shifting and aligning the people, and then getting the business payoff as a result. Yeah. Did we miss anything in there? Sounds like a lot to me. I feel pretty accomplished when you put it like that. Yeah. Well, when I look back at that first email that you sent, what you wanted to accomplish, uh, and we sailed through all of that stuff. So I feel really good about the work. And I'm so glad to count you as a success story, as a friend and a former client. So I'm uh, you know, really honored to, and I really appreciate that you come and share the story because not everyone really wants to be so publicly outed for their whole, like have the whole thing out. It's nice when it's good results, right? Uh, Steve Conine, Talent Framework. Thanks again for joining us on the show. I wanna um, thank the creator of all things Scaling Up and the Rockville Habits, Vern Harnish. Uh, also, the show is produced by Lucy Summers. Audio production is done at Podfly Productions and audio edited by Albert Burge. The show notes are compiled by Ein Kadena and proofread by Tim McGowan. If you love this show, please like it, subscribe it, give us a review right there that helps us to grow the show. And we're growing so strongly in the recent this year. Um, and we really appreciate what you're doing to help us. We also would love to hear from you. We don't hear nearly enough, and I would love to hear any parts that you love, what you want to hear more of, or anything like that. Send a note to info at scalingcoach.com. Thanks again for listening, everyone. We'll talk to you next week. Keep scaling up. 